We are ready to welcome our final speaker for this edition of 50 Best, uh, 50 Best Talks. His restaurant, Blue Hill at Stone Barns, is not only a, a regular on the 50 Best list, but also a farm, a centre for research, for culinary development, and for innovative thinking. The chef has advised presidents, written several books challenging our food systems, and created a new seed company, as well as running a top-level restaurant. So to discuss nature as our common our common ground, we are honoured to welcome Dan Barber. Jane Jacobs had a problem. Jacobs lived in Greenwich Village, New York City in the 1960s, and she loved her neighborhood. It was made up of many different kinds of businesses and many different kinds of people. Jacobs saw that her neighborhood worked. Actually, she saw that it flourished because it was filled with diversity. Where sociologists saw a frenetic and haphazard neighborhood, Jacob saw a dynamic, organic order. Where politicians saw rundown old buildings, Jacob saw opportunities for young businesses to make a start. Where urban planners saw confusion and ugliness, Jacob's saw an ecology of appetites. Her problem and it was a big one, was this man, Robert Moses. Robert Moses built more parks, beaches, parkways, and thundering expressways than anyone in any city's history. If you visited New York, you have driven through, walked through, sat in, or sailed into something that Robert Moses created. He did it by destroying the neighborhoods that Jacobs loved. He saw them as old-fashioned and inefficient. He leveraged the law to tear down old buildings, dismantling the city's shared commons to build highways and towering apartments. And by the 1960s, at the very height of his power, he planned to do exactly that in Lower Manhattan. An expressway through Jane's neighborhood through Washington Square Park, and then a major highway through Soho. The expressway had the support of just about everybody, from City Hall to the American Institute of Architects. I often think about this on my walk home from Blue Hill with my daughters, Edith and Frida, through Washington Square Park, up Fifth Avenue, into Greenwich Village, and Jane's old neighborhood. We are our family and, and Blue Hill and Blue Hill's family, the beneficiary not only of Jane's vision, but of her determination and her fight. Jane was an activist. Not tired of people doing stupid things, she would say. But her writing and her storytelling was her most effective protest. She showed how diverse neighborhoods given the support, self-organized and prospered. She mobilized her community to speak out against the idea that city planners had the right to dictate from up high. Jane won, which was impossible to have imagined back then. But her biggest win is that today, we cannot imagine her having lost. Today, no one wants to build highways through small, diverse neighborhoods. Today, it's common sense. But in the 1960s, it wasn't. To post-war planners like Moses and just about everyone else in government and business, cities needed a redesign, a master plan for the future. Above all, they needed efficiency and order, streets that should become machines to move cars, not people. Housing that should value uniformity over identity. Robert Moses and this vision, this master plan for
from my neighborhood in Greenwich Village came to mind a few weeks ago on a trip I made to the Salinas Valley in California. Salinas is a narrow strip of land along the state's central coast. Thanks to ideal weather and extraordinary soil, Salinas is one of the richest agricultural areas in the United States. It calls itself the salad bowl to the world because most of the year, nine out of every 10 bowls of salad in the United States come from this place. On my drive from the airport to Salinas of just a few weeks ago, the valley was this endless carpet of lettuce. It actually was two carpets of lettuce, romaine and iceberg. These two varieties make up more than 90% of the salad grown in the United States. Giant chemical sprayers roam the fields, large trucks lined up at distribution centers. All of it amounted to a factory that transformed fields into these bagged boxes of lettuce. But what really grabbed my attention were the plants themselves. The tens of thousands of rows surrounding me had this mystifyingly, almost military-like uniformity. I stood there in between the rows, and I felt like I was on another planet. I mean, look at this. What kind of seed can produce lettuce without a leaf out of place, with no rips or insect holes, no color variation? You get the sense that these lettuces are not a product of sun or soil or insects or water. They look engineered, pre-programmed, and in a sense, they are. The seed is itself a kind of software that dictates the exact size of lettuce, really the exact. Too long by a centimeter or two, and it won't fit in the box. And if it doesn't fit in the box, it won't fit in the shipping crate. And if the shipping crate's not full, it won't stack on the delivery truck or on the rail car. So there it is. Lettuce in the United States, the most, the most eaten fresh vegetable in our country, is engineered to fit a box. And it's not just lettuce and it's not just boxes. Squash, tomatoes, wheat, nearly everything we eat in the US and increasingly around the world is designed for efficiency. Diversity is out. We think that agribusiness controls the food system, but when it comes to harvesting and distribution and processing and the market, seeds, seeds muscle it all into position. Modern varieties and their power, powerful little blueprints aren't simply part of the problem. They really are the problem. And because seeds determine how we eat, we should be alarmed by the current architects. Four chemical companies now control more than 60% of the world's seeds. How'd this happen? How did four chemical companies come to control the future of our food? Their methods remind me of Robert Moses. Like Moses, they amass enormous power. And just as Moses tore down old tenements to build highways, seed companies uprooted ecologies and replaced them with monocultures. They argued that advances in seed technology would feed a growing population. They argued that diversity is just inefficient. And they were pretty successful at that. 75%, two out of every three vegetable and grain varieties have been lost in just 100 years. Two out of every three. And like Moses, seed companies use laws to establish their goals. They actually help create brand new laws, like patent protections, meaning corporations can now own life. This is bananas. Patents take away farmers' freedom to save seed, something they have been doing for 10,000 years. In the name of progress, they dismantle our shared commons. So it starts to look something like this. A corporation, a seed corporation, 
cannot own onions or cauliflower or carrots or tomatoes. But they can, and they do own genes for bitterness in onions. And they own a gene for a particular kind of sweetness in tomato. And that purple color in purple carrots is also owned under a gene patent. There is even a gene and genetic ownership on what is called a pleasant-tasting melon. Which means that these corporations not only own taste, they, they define it too. If all of this sounds crazy, it's because it is crazy. The worst part of it is that none of what I just mentioned tastes good at all. In response, most of us, most of us chefs especially, but many of us in this room, turn to this, to old seeds. Chefs especially are fanatical about heirlooms, ancient grains, heritage breeds. As a proselytizer for these things myself, I confess to it. We privilege the past, the old, the forgotten, the ignored. And it's tough to blame us because these things taste so good. But they are not the only answer. My heart says they are one of the answers, but they are not the only answer. We must stop claiming that to cook truly, truly delicious food and truly nutritious food today, that we have to celebrate the flavors of the past. We are here, all of us today, among the most innovative and modern chefs in the history of the world. Chefs who have embraced more advances in gastronomy in the last 30 years than in the last 300. We honor ancient recipes for sure, but we also update them. We actually honor them by updating them. We advance new flavors by manipulating old ones, carefully, appropriately, thoughtfully. And now we have to do the same with seeds. Seeds are not a black and white issue. Heirlooms over here, Monsanto maniacs over there. There's actually an enormous spectrum in between the two. And we have to educate ourselves about it. Which is why I went to Salinas, California to meet this man. Frank Bishop. Now I've changed his name to protect his identity. Frank is not a criminal. He's not a tax evader or a member of a right-wing cult. He is a lettuce breeder. His specialty is in creating new varieties of salad greens. 30 years ago, he started a small company, which was purchased by a larger seed company, which was purchased by an even larger seed company, and on and on, five times, until Monsanto became the owner. Overnight, Monsanto got rid of 80% of Frank's seeds. Multinational companies do not save seeds to preserve them, and they don't donate them. They make them disappear. So just like that, overnight, a lifetime of Frank's work was erased. And then a few years ago, Monsanto ended Frank's breeding program completely. At 70 years old, Frank considered retiring. I went to bed one night, and I told my wife, that's it, I'm tired of it, he told me. And then the next morning I woke up, I woke up and I was filled with energy. I realized, I'm not tired of breeding lettuce. I'm tired of Monsanto doing stupid things. So Frank started a lettuce breeding company. He did it because from deep inside the belly of the corporate beast, he saw the potential to change the system from the ground up. He saw a growing market that cared about nutrition. Romaine and iceberg, he told me, don't have nutrition. Those things fell through the crack when I was breeding because I had other priorities to breed for. Frank had to always select for that military uniformity to get them to fit the box, which meant everything else, like vitamins and micronutrients and flavor too, were discarded. Today, the most fresh, the most popular fresh tasting, the most popular fresh vegetable in America is grown on more than 100,000 acres on the best soil in the world. And it is essentially a vessel for shipping water all over North America. So Frank began selecting for high anthrocyanin lettuces, a purple colored romaine. 
He stopped breeding for boxes. He started focusing on creating lettuce to thrive regionally. Because Frank also sees a younger generation demanding local food with flavor. Frank was asking, if there's a demand for lettuce with flavor, why don't I breed let flavorful lettuce? Here is a test plot of these dark green lettuces that Frank created to look exactly like a head of spinach. The texture is smooth and creamy. It is, it is unlike any green I've ever eaten. According to Frank, it is also bite for bite the single most nutritious lettuce you can put in your mouth. And this one, a prehistoric looking lettuce, he calls it a dinosaur lettuce, with a texture like celery and a tartness like a cooking apple. It's amazing. Over the past year, I have been introduced to more varieties than I can name, not just lettuces, beets, potatoes, squashes, peppers, peas, modern varieties of all of these, from dozens of breeders like Frank all over the world. All are richly nutritious and jaw-droppingly delicious. And seed companies don't want them, but we do. A group of breeders and I launched a company over this last two years, a new seed company called Grow7, to get this kind of diversity out into the world. For these ingredients to leave the cathedral of our white tablecloth restaurants and become as accessible as they are craveable. Breeders like Frank are brilliant, but they cannot do it alone. As I looked around this room earlier and took a look at the gathering of chefs and thought about the organizing principle of 50 Best and all that it provides, I thought, who better to lead this movement than chefs? Chefs as champions. Well, actually, that originated here in France, didn't it? Nouvelle cuisine chefs rejected outdated traditions by presenting smaller portions and artistic plating, by pledging allegiance to local markets, by expressing their connection to place. By becoming diverse communities in their own right, they launched modern gastronomy. That's what we need to do now. Chefs to champion diversity, to illuminate and mobilize our communities, to take control of our neighborhoods, to reject the idea that seed companies have the right to dictate from up high, to build these ridiculous monoculture highways through our rich ecologies, to refuse their claim that they own taste, by rejecting the notion that seed is software fit for a box. To, prote to protest and to protect seed for what it is, dynamic, living, delicious. If we do it right, we'll win. I admit that it's tough to imagine at this moment with those kind of odds stacked against us. But in the long run, our biggest win will be 100 years from now. They will look back and say, we cannot imagine them having lost. Thank you. Mr. Mm -hmm. Barber, ladies and gentlemen, thank you again. Uh, it's great to have you. Uh, good promoting, as always.